hockey. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite. It's Judd's Hockey Show. And it is Judd's Hockey Show. And uh, my God, what a difference a week makes. <laughs> a week ago, the Wild was in an absolute free fall. Seven consecutive losses. Dean Evason, we did a whole show about if he might be fired and when. And then we did that on Monday afternoon, Dex. And then, of course, later in the day, right before, I think as I was driving to the stadium for the Vikings game, Dean was fired. John Hines came in. And we all said, okay, that's great. What's going to happen? And, uh, my God, it's been a world difference. Three consecutive wins, including a 4-1 win over the Blackhawks on Sunday at the X. Plenty to get to, but before we do that, I want to thank um, our sponsor for this show, Livia Weight Control Centers. And ladies and gentlemen, I have good news for you. Their Black Friday offer has been extended. Look at that sports dad on the left, sports dad on the right. What's the difference? 40 pounds is the difference. And now I want you to join. There have been plenty of people from the Score North family who have taken advantage of this program, and uh, they have all just chimed in about what a great program it is and how they have dropped the pounds. Uh, with their Black Friday offer extended, you join today, you save up to 50%. Visit Livia.com. That's L I V E A.com. Call 855-GO-LIVIA, L-I-V-E-A. Go to Minnesota's best weight loss program. Three years in a row, Livia.com. That's where your life begins to change for the better. All right, Dex. Um, so under John Hines mm-hmm. in three games, <laughs> and, and I'll get to, I'll get to some of the questions I actually asked him post-game yesterday, but under John Hines in three games, the Wild has outscored their opponents 13-3. to three. Mm-hmm. So they've given up exactly one goal per game, Blues, Predators, Blackhawks. They are three for eight on the power play, including two of three yesterday against what I will fully say is a bad Blackhawks team. So not trying to sell the Blackhawks as a good team. And they have probably most impressively for them, they have killed 10 of 11 penalties with Bob Woods now gone um, and certainly some tweaks. What's your overall takeaway? You know, three games, as the kids love to say, very small sample size. But this does look like a different team. It does look like a different team. Uh, and the things that I th- what, what we did a show Friday afternoon, um, and I said the things that I would like to see that I think would be obtainable because, look, they're, they're playing with a little bit more confidence and a spark, and they feel upset because they got their coach fired. And, man, we have seen this song and dance numerous times. So it, it's hard. Two things. It's hard to really buy into that they're legit, but also you do have to give them credit for winning three games and winning them, honestly, pretty convincingly. But the areas that... I still want to see improve or um, or take a turn for the better for the course of this new streak under John Hines is the penalty kill. Penalty kill, I thought, was going to be the one thing you can probably fix and and make a lot better. Like, the goaltending has been better, but three goals allowed during this three-game winning streak, so you'll take that every single time. Uh, but you probably aren't going to be outscoring your opponents like this. The Wild just don't have, unless Boldy and Kaprizov wake up, which if that is the case, all right, that's a new layer to this conversation that we can probably get into but their penalty kill has to be better, and their goaltending has to be better. I think those are two things that can naturally become better over the course of time with some tweaks here and there, especially the penalty kill. If that stuff trends in the right direction, Judd, and then the other things start to fall into place, the Kaprizov, Boldies, maybe a power play, uh, maybe you find out a better third-pairing defenseman that's more sustained. Like There are other nuanced layers that we could get into of where the Wild are, uh, could be a legit team under John Hines. But the areas that I wanted to see improvement drastically were penalty kill and goaltending, and they are certainly getting that over this uh, little winning streak they're on. Yeah, uh, Flurry at times was brilliant on Sunday. He made, uh, on the uh, first period, Blackhawks power play. He made, like, three big saves, and the Blackhawks were all over the wild in that power play. And then the third period, he was spectacular. Uh, Gustafson, to his credit against the Blues and Predators, also very good. The penalty killing looks competent. I don't love it still, but it looks, I, I mean, you know, one power play goal in three games is yeah. a far cry from the crap that we were being forced to watch. Um, here's the thing. So in watching the game yesterday again, so I, I've seen two of the three games live um, since Hines got the job, the Blues game and then the Blackhawks game. And in watching it, I was interested in why the dynamic of the speed looks so different. Because clearly guys don't get faster. Like, it's not like, it's not like, oh, Dean's out. I'm Matt Zuccarello, and now I'm going to skate like the wind. Right. So there are, you know, I agree with all of you who say, hey, first of all, it's three games. But second of all, like, it's not like John Hines came in and changed everything. He didn't redo their system. Now that could be done eventually, but it's not being done right now. But in watching the speed, I'm like, okay, what's, what's what's the formula here? Because he clearly came in 
and altered some things just as far as the thought process. And I asked Flurry about it, and I asked Heinz. And I'm going to read you part of Heinz' quote um, because basically my question was the speed that you've shown, the increased speed that this team's shown under you is not like a fluke. Like it's that that's not a short-term thing. That is a you got it or you don't. And he said, I think just being more predictable coming into our own end and knowing where pucks are, pucks are placed, what our roots are going to be. I think when you can be predictable and when guys know where people are going to be, you can play a fast game, even if you're under pressure, because I think you can think quickly and you can execute faster. So organize coming into our own zone when pucks are dumped in, where the outs are going to be for the passes, where they're placed, and then also just reading things in transition. And I thought that was a good response because that is something like it's not the players haven't gotten faster as far as their foot speed. What they've done is they've started to move the puck quickly. And I think if you watch the games, you definitely see that, that that there is a premium now being put on. Don't think about it. Get the puck out. Right. So this makes sense to me as far as, okay, this is why the game looks to be because your transitions now are quicker and you're not being. and, And Flurry's point was. If the transitions aren't quicker, your opponent gets to the neutral zone and their own blue line and gums it up. So you basically have to play dump and chase, which is what people started to complain about with Dean. Mm-hmm. So it does make sense. And th- and this would not be a hard change. L- like it would not take a, a lot of film work or chalkboard work here. This would be an easy change to say in like one practice. These are my principles of what we're going to do to move the puck out. But – that does explain why this team looks to be playing what I would consider to be far more free and easy, Declan, than what we saw. And I, again, I don't know exactly what Dean was thinking or what, but than what we saw um, with Dean, especially this year. I, I don't want to blame him for the entirety of problems because he actually had this team playing fast at one time. So this is where it's like hard to quantify because when we had Jesse on uh, last Wednesday, we asked, you know, can the Wild play a, a – play with speed and, and keep up with like teams that have really good horses that can go up and down the ice really well. So I think my answer to that is still no. Like I, I don't think you can get into a track meet. And I think, but I do think there is a huge difference between getting into a track meet and playing quick, playing fast, playing in transition, right? Like th- that, in my opinion, that, that, that doesn't go down to speed necessarily. It doesn't go down to you guys having the fastest players in the ice. That goes down, I think, to a hockey IQ. Like that is putting players and putting the puck in the right positions at the right time. And I think that's where they could actually can play with the speed. Like John Hines likes to play with speed. He coached Devils teams that were quicker. You know, Predators, I think the the majority of the Predators teams he had were actually kind of a little bit more comparable to these wild teams that we've seen a lot before. I don't think they had the skill of a Kirill Kaprizov on those teams necessarily. But, you know, those teams were deep. Those teams, you know, had four lines that could roll. Um, they, they weren't necessarily top end skill, but he could always milk points out of them. And they were always, you know, near the playoff conversation. But I think the difference between the wild playing with speed and like wanting to get into a track meet with like a Colorado or a Dallas, which yes. in my opinion would be disastrous, yep. is playing smart. Like what Flower said right there. Like that is that's a genius quote. That's a great quote. If you don't get the guys in the right transition and in the right spots to move the puck and not play hero ball, I know that doesn't apply to hockey, but not play hero ball where you're trying to go up and down the ice and and deke and deke all around. That's different. I think that part of the game where if they're playing in transition, yes. Then they can play with speed, but in terms of wanting to get into a whole 200 foot game against a powerful foe, uh, I think the Wild would be very overmatched in that situation. Still, that quote was actually Hines. Here's oh, Hines. here's Flower on the same thing. He said, I, "I think Coach Hines has changed just a few things, just little tweaks to allow us to play faster, maybe stretch the zone a little quicker, D zone to neutral zone, a couple of those breakouts just get a touch, uh, just get a touch faster, so we can get skating get." moving and push their defense back and not wait until they're all set up and waiting for us in the neutral zone. That makes perfect sense. So it's tough to get through them if they are there. We've had odd man rushes, some good chances. Then once you win, once you get a few goals, a few like everybody relaxes and sees the ice better, just everything slows down a bit. So, yeah, I I think what we're talking about here is is basically the simplest form of like if if you have – a football team that gets cute, right? Yeah. A lot of horizontal passes, a lot of, you know, and and a coach comes in and says, we're going to move the ball down the field. Like we're going to use the vertical game. That to me is what this is. 
And so, yeah, you're you're right. It has nothing. It has nothing to do with trying to skate with Nate McKinnon. Yes. Right. It's not like I'm going to match your speed. It's like we're going to match. I, I think the better word than speed is probably pace. Yeah, it's probably a better one. Because yep. it's it, it's your pace of play. Yes. Um, but there is no question that this looks uh, this looks like this team is far more, at least for three games, suited to this. The other thing I like that Hines has done, he's tweaked personnel, not huge, but have you noticed they put Brock Faber more on the power play? Yes, this is. I wanted to see that with you before, like we were doing preseason stuff. That was something I've wanted to see for yep. a long time now, and I would like to. I would like to continue to see that more. I think you will do it more. Yeah. I, I think he might be among their defensemen. I and and I didn't realize so. In the athletic story by uh, Joe Smith, uh, Joe Smith off the game yesterday, I didn't realize did Brock not play on the power play with with the Gophers? It basically alluded to, to the fact that he did, didn't get a lot of college power play time. But I think long term or heck short term, he might be their most suited defenseman mm. to a power play job. Mm-hmm. Like I don't think it's Spurgeon. And Brodeen's Brodeen, and I he's, he's fantastic. But I, you know, the more I see, it's it's weird. The more Faber is asked to do, instead of shrinking, I think he gets better. So I I think Spurgeon's still fine for the power play. I don't really want to see Brodeen. I like I I love him. That's not a knock on on Brodeen's game. I agree with you. Yeah. I just I don't really want to see a lot of minutes going to to Brodeen necessarily on the power play unless it's like out of necessity with injuries. Uh, yeah, I don't I didn't watch. A ton of gopher hockey with Faber over there. Um, that was a little past of when I, I stopped watching it as much and covering a lot of gopher hockey, I should say. But mm-hmm. uh, it is interesting that he's finally getting power play time because I do think he possesses the ability to, yeah, be a guy who should be able to thrive on the power play. And now with, with Dumba gone and you traded Kalen Addison, like you traded two guys who kind of their their wheelhouse was have being on the man advantage. So you're kind of down a horse there. So instead, can you put Brock Faber in those situations? And yeah, I think there's more. There's clearly a a Brodeen light to his game, right? Like he's a good skater. He's a good defensive player. Um, we'll see if he can even you know elevate it, that game even more. But I do think maybe it's just the mystery box of him. But like there is a crystal ball of where is his offensive game, like in a good way, not in a bad way. Like right. where where does his offensive game project in his career? Because right. clearly he can skate and he can play. That's obvious. We've already seen that, in a, and I think we've even seen that enough in the small sample size uh, of his NHL career. But what is his offensive game, and can he be used in a situation where instead, yeah, he might be able to score you five or ten goals in the power play in a season? My sense is that the biggest compliment I can give him is that he is about, and this is not to say he does not uh, screw up because he does at times, but we all do. He is about as smooth as you can get. Like, that's the thing I like. You give him assignments or jobs and he looks like he belongs there which i mean he's a rookie and and what's impressive is he does this in on the ice he does this in the locker room like he has become and and you know don't roll your eyes about this folks but brock faber's become like a go-to quote for that team he's a rookie yeah he's, he's a rookie well he's always there he's always willing to answer questions like these these are things that when you're looking for what makes a captain, like what makes a guy that can lead a team, mm-hmm. when you're doing this as, and and I know he, he had college, so he's not 18, which obviously helps. But my God, am I impressed. And I do think, I think the fact that Hines also, one thing I like is this, he did bring, a, he did bring and brings a fresh set of eyes. So like he might not, it would not be a good idea to come in here and change anything everything. I understand that. But I do feel that he's making some changes that I like to see and that he doesn't have any misconceptions or conce- or he doesn't have any perceived biases. Yeah, right. I'll give you one. I'll give you one that I absolutely loved. And it, it's small and it's not surprising, but I don't think Dean would have ever done this. And this is not to fault Dean. He was just there a long time. And I think he had some, he definitely had some biases towards players that sort of rem- reminded him of himself. But yesterday, Ryan Hartman comes back, and the three lines, the first three lines are playing well. And instead of saying, I got to get Hartman on at least the third line, right? I got to get him on the wing on at least the third line. Hines says, okay, fourth line. We'll put him on the wing, or we'll put him on the fourth line. 
I don't think, Declan, that happens with Dean. And I'm not saying that's a pivotal thing. Like, that doesn't make or break a team or a season. But I do think it's an important indicator of a fresh set of eyes yeah. that, that this franchise probably desperately needed because, you know, Bill Guerin's not going to stand in, in the way of that. And I think that that is, I would far more side with Hartman being on the fourth line than forcing him back into like a top six role. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've made some, my, my feelings clear on where I think he should be uh, throughout the course of, of this season and even going parts to last after his kind of pop up 30 goal campaign. But that's that's exactly what I want to see. I want to see a guy who puts him in the right position. Like I still don't love the contract extension, but like I'm not, just, I can't just come on here every time and right, you know, Bash bitch it. about Ryan Hartman because he got paid. But can he be used in situations where he's an effective player? That's where he's effective. And I, I also think when we even say that, people think it's backhanded. Like, well, no, he was a top line center and he scored thirty goals. Like that, that was a fluke. Anomaly. It, it was. It was. It was an anomaly. Yes. It, it was not sustainable. Yep. But I do think he has a very good role of being a very good bottom six player. And Hines has seen that too. That's to your point. He came in, didn't want to force things just because one side did something. And look, he's seen Ryan Hartman a lot being in Nashville before. Like he knows who Ryan Hartman is. So instead of force feeding him into the, you know, top line with Kirill Kaprizov or Zuccarello or just keeping him in the top six and putting him with other good players, he's finding roles for him to be successful in the ways Ryan Hartman should be successful. Mm -hmm. And I think that is uh, also your, yeah, that is, that is a good thing that Hines has done here where he's not set in the ways. And um, I'm sure... You know, I know Garen Bates, we had this in place, right? Like Dean gets fired and John Hines gets the job. There's no interim label. It all happened within a bang-bang situation. And I'm sure there's more of a... Um, Garen seems a little bit more of a hands-off and Hines is kind of his buddy. They go back a little bit. So I don't even think that's like a collaboration of like Bill saying, put Ryan Hartman on the fourth. No. That, that, this is this is Bill Garen saying, I trust you. Yep. What, do you what do you want to do to fix these things? And yep. I'll give you the players and the personnel that are needed, but... I'm going to let you put your eyes and brain on this, and you can you can probably fix it. Yeah, and that, that's when, you know, there, there's a lot of things that go into the conversation about when we talk about a coach having a shelf life, especially in this sport. Yeah. And some of that is preconceived ideas about or, or long-held ideas about, you know, Hartman had 30 goals two years ago, and look what he did, and he works his ass off, and he does all those things. That doesn't make him, and that never made him a guy who should have stayed for any amount of time um, centering the top line, and he's really not a top six guy, which is, that's fine. He's got a role. Uh, but I just like, I really like the fact that what we're getting now is very clearly a guy who came in and said, okay, this is not, because it's not a terrible team. Not a great team, not a terrible team, but he's actually open to, I don't have the thing about, well, if I put Hartman on the fourth line, that's going to em embarrass him. John Hines doesn't care about that. And, and he shouldn't. Let's talk about the rookies, too, before we get done here. Uh, first of all, I'm going to defend Connor Bedard, okay? Okay. Because I'm seeing the Thinking stories. The, but the stories today are like Connor Bedard wasn't yeah, even I, the top two rookie uh, and blah, blah, blah. And, yes, that's a good story. I probably would have written the same thing. So I'm not faulting the journalists. <laughs> but I am saying this. Connor Bedard's on a horse bleep team yeah. that has a lot of problems um, he is too small. He is too small to be playing right now, except his skill is so off the charts that he deserves like he deserves a job that he's not big enough for, if that makes sense, because his skill level is unbelievable. Um, but I watch him play and I see. Do you know what I see physically? Just as far as his like actual physique goes, not his skills. I see Marco Rossi a couple of years ago. Interesting. Just as, as far as the build goes, he's mm. too small. Like he's playing against men, and if they can catch up to him and he can't like outdeek them, they knock him off the puck. Now, of course, the, these guys are all the best players probably in the world. So, like if you or I tried to knock the poor kid off the puck, he we, would yeah, he he would make us look like morons. <laughs> um, but so I am not going to dump on Bedard here. I actually feel bad for him especially with all the stuff that was out there a couple weeks ago. That being said, we've talked about Faber, but Rossi yesterday had two goals, played 15-10, and again, I'll go back to what we just talked about with Hines. I love the fact that a coach comes in here and looks at Rossi 
and doesn't really know that much about two years ago, right, or last year, or when I watch this kid play, I'm going to tell you right now, there is no reason in on God's green earth why he was not the center of the top line on day one. He's matured. He's matured. He goes to the front of the net. He takes a lot of hits now, and guess what? He doesn't move much. Mm-mm. This is... This is another player, I think, that's going to benefit from the fact that this coach didn't see him when when he was scuffling or making mistakes that Dean couldn't tolerate. I think Hines, Dean was going there, but I think Hines immediately is treating Marco Rossi with the, what's the word, respect, with the, yeah. he's evaluating him based totally. on what he's seeing, and this kid is damn good. If you extrapolated... Uh... Marco Rossi's performance this season over 82 games. He's on pace for a 29 goal campaign, which is obviously humongous. Yep. Uh, good for about 52 points as well. Like he is having the year that we thought he should have. And yeah, I think the strength was there. I mean, even on Hockey Reference right now, I don't know if this is true, but like on HockeyReference.com, he is built 5'9", 182. Would you say he's he's even bigger than that, or would was that? Like that's weight about wise, right. is that probably about right? But he's built like, but he's that's that's like muscle. Ox. Yeah, built like ox. Yeah. That's that's muscle now. Yes. Um. And yeah, he's just he looks a lot more confident too, which was and look, he had some very uh, shaky, scary off the ice situations that I think definitely stunted some development there, which the obviously was was awful that was happening to him. So sure. he had a, he had a horrible curveball thrown his way. But yes, he looks a lot more like the guy who everyone thought was like the biggest steal of this draft that fell all the way to number nine. Out of the wild, and he looks great. Uh, on Bedard, so you got to see him in person, obviously, yesterday. And yes, Chicago, just still a dump. Um, dumpster fire. Absolute dumpster fire. But you think that there is still a lot more to Bedard. Like, you're not calling Bedard a bus. I know you're not calling Bedard Oh, a bus. no, he's going to be a star. He's going to be a star. He's going to be a superstar. No, he no. Needs, he needs, like, 25 more pounds and a little bit more of experience before you can really yeah. quantify him I'm as defend- being like a star. I'm yeah. defending him. Yeah. Totally. No, he's going to be a superstar. And and what I'm saying is you can at times see what he brings. Um, he does some things that the majority of guys in that league can't do. But I'm defending him and saying it's not fair to say, well, he was the third best, like like as if to put him down. He's going to be great. Uh, he is not. He's not going to be a bust. He's fantastic. Uh, I just feel. I feel for him because, to your point, he's in a dumpster yeah. fire. It's not like he's on a great line. Chicago's still a complete mess. This crap that he went went through, uh, you, you know, on Twitter slash X slash whatever was absolute garbage for a kid. Absolutely. Um, I don't even know at this point too. I don't fault him for his size cuz he's just not matured yet. So it's not like it's not like he, he could have gone into the weight room this summer and gotten really big. Like he's not there yet. He's not. Um he reminds me from a size standpoint a little bit of how Gretzky looked w- when Gretzky oh. started, but the oh. difference but the difference is the speed of the game now. Like these yeah. guys are so what Connor Bedard's playing against is so much different than what Wayne played against. Oh yes. Like Wayne played against grown men, but they were slower. These guys now are so fast. And, and, you know, again, if they bump him off the puck, he's going to go off the puck. He's got no chance right now. That will change. But there there, there was the one, uh, one-on-one in the wild zone on the second period last night or yesterday afternoon in which Faber was going against Bedard. And he it was actually a great, great little one-on-one matchup, and Faber won it. And Faber, you could tell the fact that Faber and Rossi and, and, and you know, to be fair, again, they are in their early 20s, but ours 18. But you could tell the fact that those guys spent the summer here working their asses off has contributed huge. So I'm just, I'm very high on what those guys can bring. And the one thing is, if you are not in a playoff spot at Thanksgiving, it's yeah. a big deal. Yep. But if you look at what the Wild is doing right now, and they're going on a tough trip. Like, they're going on a West Coast, uh, what, uh, Calgary, is it Vancouver? Calgary, Vancouver, Seattle. So that's, yeah, that's a tough trip. That's a tough trip. But if they can if they can keep up any of this momentum, they're going to be in pretty good shape. Um, 
But if nothing else, this team now is fun to watch again. Absolutely. It's been a while. By the way, shout out to our friends at Summit Orthopedics, Summit Ortho. You know, maybe you got some pain going on. Uh, you know, it's getting the winter time, and you know, you know, you realize that shoulder from playing golf, or you got tweaked your back. You know, you oh. yeah, just don't don't want to oh. deal with that. That's never fun, right? So how about you go to our friends at Summit Orthopedics? There's a ton of locations. Uh, I believe 25 in the metro, even more in the greater Minnesota area too. You can go to summitortho.com. To book that appointment today, summitortho.com. Shout out to Summit Orthopedics. They help sponsor programming here on Score North. All right, sir. Outstanding. We're done. We um, we now have, hopefully, a team that's turned itself around because mm. Judd's Hockey Show is a lot more fun when the Wild is good well. and can win some games. Uh, and I'm sure that our friends at Bally Sports North feel the exact same way because we're all one team or some, something like that. Dex, take us home. Yeah, pass, shoot, score, and hit the subscribe button for daily Minnesota sports entertainment.